for black trans people, the production of signs of images have to do with an action that moves energy, that produces movement, and that produces forms of justice that have been dislocated and have been erased by processes of colonialism. To make sense of the representation of Black trans women of signs of freedom, you have to essentially recognize that political dimension of those signs. Good afternoon, good evening, everyone. My name is Macarena Gomez Varis, or Maca. I am the current director of the Global South Center at Pratt Institute, and I'm also chair of social science and cultural studies um, in, at Pratt Institute as well. And tonight we have a co-sponsored event, and it's really exciting um, to have that event. But I first wanted to tell you about an upcoming event that we have, October 29th, 5.30 p.m. with Nicole Fleetwood called Marking Time, Art and Age of Mass Incarceration. Nicole will be present here with two artists and I'm very excited that that event will be co-sponsored by the Arfa, uh, Arfalfa Center and that's UC Santa Barbara with Palomar directing it. So thank you so much for supporting and working with us on these con collaborative projects. It's exciting to think about um, what we can do in the future for that event. I also wanted to introduce our co-directors. Um, we are trying something very different this year in our co-programming and working together um, with uh, Wendy Munoz, who's there and also working to document the event and part of something called the Social Media Lab with Nur Heitz Tul uh, Jamil. Um, we call uh, um, her Zat Jamil, who is also co-director, and Cisco Bradley and Jaina Brown. And these are uh, all the co-directors for the Global South Center and have been working hard on programming and projects and we'll have a new website soon. So that's very exciting. I'm not gonna introduce our wonderful speaker, um, Dora Santana tonight. Uh, Professor Zat Jamil has that uh, honor. And I just wanted to say that uh, Zat is a wonderful, not only co-director of the Social Media Lab and in the Global South Center, but has been working very strongly with critical and visual studies and um, is professor of Global South Studies. And uh, thank you so much, Zat, for introducing um, our wonderful speaker tonight. Uh, and uh, I'll pass it to you. And thank you, Dora Santana, for being here tonight with us. Thank you. Thank you, Maka, for the opening remarks. Um, can everyone hear me? Yeah? Good. So I'm Nurhaiza Tujamil, and I go by Zat, as Maka mentioned. Um, I'm one of the co-directors of the Global South Center. Um, and together with my colleague, Professor Wendy Muniz, I also coordinate the Social Media Lab at GSC. We're about to launch our website, which we've been working on um, really hard. And so please look out for that. It is an honor for me today to be able to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Dora Santana. Dr. Santana is a Black Brazilian trans woman warrior, scholar, activist, artist, storyteller of experiences embodied in language and flesh. She is also an assistant professor of gender studies at John Jay College, CUNY. Her work has been published in various um, publications, including the Transgender Studies Quarterly. She was also an artist in residence for Algo, a queer people of color organization in Austin. In 2017, she produced her solo performance titled Minha Filha, A Black Trans Daughterhood. And in 2018, she had a water, watercolor exhibition entitled Trans Stellar Visions. She has also written extensively for various publications, including the Feminist Wire and Logueras Negras. So when I read Dora's work, I was struck by her discussion of movement as a metaphor to describe collective mobilization and the idea that one could and should think of the text as a space of transition to rethink conceptual formations tied to trans, travesty, blackness, and negritude. I was also deeply moved by her provocation for us to think about living and life under conditions of extreme duress. I think that this is really critical for us to meditate on, especially when Black trans women extensively endure police brutality, cis heteropatriarchy, toxic masculinity, and trans misogynoir on a daily basis. And here I'm thinking about Nina Pop, Malaysia Buka, Brie Black, and countless others who lost their lives to unimaginable violence. May they rest in power. Yet as Dora argues in her article, Mais Viva, and I quote, the deaths of 
the death of trans and black people mobilize more action than our living, our vivencia, end quote. Amidst this dispossession, despair, and uncertainty, Dora compels us to question, what do you do as a living being? What do you do to heal? As abolitionist and activist Mariam Kaba reminds us, hope is a discipline. I'm grateful to Dora for prompting us to think about what that looks like in practice, especially when the condition of being black and trans resembles fugitivity embodied in a living of refusal. A refusal to lose oneself, a refusal to lose faith in decolonizing community. So, and so with that, please join me in welcoming and building community with Dr. Dora Centena. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction and the engagement uh, with the, the work. I'm very uh, always, you know, excited um, to hear um, some form of, you know, feedback because writing sometimes it's a very lonely process and to be able to hear and so oh, this calls my attention, you know, you have a little a bit of joy <laughs> when you uh, think of that. Um, so I want to thank uh, the invitation and uh, the organizers of this event. Uh, I want to um, to also um, hope that, you know, check in, hope that you're okay during this pandemic. We are here because there is a pandemic happening. I don't want to pretend like <laughs> Like, there is not, it is a, a, a context. I just want to put that out there and uh, thank everyone. Some of my friends are here. Um, also, really, I think a shout out to my partner who really got me grounded today for this talk within the anxiety of giving talks under this environment that uh, usually really rubs us from the back and forth and the energy of being person. Um, so I want to share um, my, the way I've structured a few things to share with you through a PowerPoint. I think I'm able to share uh, here, right? Um, so let me do that. So I'm able to uh, share. Can you still see me or not? Yeah, I, yeah, I don't, I never know. <laughs> so, um, so you can see the, that, the PowerPoint. So I'm going to start with this. Um, and uh, also, so before us going to the PowerPoint, I want you to pay attention to me, like to this image here, right? Uh, one interesting thing that that I believe that I do, but other people are doing during this time, is that the image and how we present um, in, indexes a lot of different meanings. And I'm, I keep, I get myself also um, decoding those meanings as I look at people's backgrounds, what kind of books they have, what kind of images they have around them. We, and we are also intentional of producing, right, the signs that um, make us um, this text on this, on this, on this virtual, um, you know, um, way of, of communicating with each other. So I wanted to do something in, in do this experiment of what does it mean for you to see me uh, like this and what does it mean to see me like this? Can you see what is above? You can see yes, no, or something. I think like we have to like magnify the screen or like because it's like it shows you in a small corner. Oh, okay. Sorry, I didn't know that. So what I have in the top is um, so what I'm gonna do and here is what I have in the top is a phoenix, right? And Sometimes I choose of uh, including the phoenix on the frame with my blackness and my transness on the frame. Sometimes I choose to just include on the frame my blackness and my transness, right? And whatever else science people can see within this frame. And I'm talking a blackness in the frame 
through a discussion by Dr. Simone Brown in her book of uh, Dark Matters, when she asks, "What does ha what does ha what happens when blackness gets into the frame?" Right, and um, so since we are communicating through frames, I'm sharing with you this frame so it grounds a little bit of what I'm thinking in terms of placing black trans women against other forms of icon icons and, and symbols and actually establishing this connection right between those so i like the association with the phoenix because of the under of the the compositions of this sign especially the idea of fire and the idea of wing in the wings right with the idea of freedom but also of rebirth so for my talk today i'm choosing those two aspects and those two um, signs to discuss representations of black women as our association of black women's black trans women and those forms of signs as something fiery but also something that allows us to fly right uh, the associations with wings as well um so okay so i'd like you to shift your attention to the frame uh that is there like the frame with the the, the powerpoint and on the frame of the, the PowerPoint, I uh, share, I'm sharing with you an image that I created, a collage actually in 2015, when I, I was still thinking about my project and uh, an aspect of my project. And something that called my attention was the image of the Inkisi, right? Which is this wooden figure from Bantu cultures. And what is underneath it is this set of, of um, threads that are tied together and pierced with uh, nails. And that is a process that was, uh, um, that was done as a form of a spiritual practice, but also as an agreement within different Bantu communities. And these images usually have a hole within them. And according to the priest or the bunch of priest, priest that would have um, um, specialized knowledge into certain different energies, you would insert different things within that image. So if you had certain priests that are related to certain uh, healing practices that are relating to um, certain birds, uh, they would put feathers inside it, right? They would put some herbs inside it. So depending on the healing, you would put in something inside that body and they would have this community agreement to tie um, certain issues or, that they were facing in a collective form that is embodied in this body um, of the Inkisi. So what does that have to do with our discussion today? So I am coming, using as a framework to think of Black trans women's uh, um, symbols and in, in, in iconic representations through um, uh, epistemologists from the South, right? So Bantu cultures and, and, and also Bantu, Bantu embodiments uh, through Black trans women bodies have been described in Inquisition archives, both in Brazil and in Angola uh, during in, uh, the, the colonial time. Uh, and in those archives, you have figures such as the Kimbanda, which is described um, as quotes this man dressing in, in women because they, um, they found that the way that this trans femme was dressed in Brazil was the way that Ubuntu women or women from Congo um, uh, kingdom would dress at, at that time across the Atlantic, right? So I, I'm interested then in this aspect of connections that, that ties those different parts of the diaspora, but also this idea of virtuality, right? Of understanding that there is a virtuality relationship to the agreements that is made to the composition of this image, right? And that connects different parts of the diaspora that is related to an understanding of also faith, but also justice that is intrinsically associated with an idea that, that it heals, right? That someone needs um, some form of training into healing to promote some form of agreement that comes 
to a sense of justice within the community, right? To catch a certain issue. So today I'm thinking about what I'm calling these not, these not works, and the sense of virtuality of representation within this Afro-cosmologist from the South to think about transness, to think about blackness, to think about diaspora, and uh, the framework for our conversation today. Um, why icon, icon Iconica, right? Uh, which is this icon with Iconica from Brazil. Because I think of, especially now, symbols and signs as very informative of the ways we can think of decolonizing knowledge. So one of the major, one of the, the ways that I that I established connections with this image and the not in relationship to virtuality, to faith, to, to hope as well, was through my uh, contact with um, the ribbons in, in Brazil, right? So in Brazil, the ribbons or the, as fitas, the Senhor do Bonfim, with the ribbons from Bonfim, is a form of expression that is associated with a saint, but it's also a form of syncretized um, um, expression of connections with Orisha or Afro cosmologists in Brazil as well. So those saints in, in, the, in this form of syncretisms are also linked or um, their meanings are associated with certain uh, Orishas in Afro-Brazilian um, um, religions, right? And faith and spirituality. And this is one of the examples of how colonialism um, acts through a process of dislocation of, of, of dimensions of a sign, right? And forcing to reassemble um, those signs and those meanings um, in those, uh, in those signs that are in relationship to faith. And that we're able to recuperate some of these connections by the kinds of networks that we establish as we, you know, get in contact with those different signs and try to reestablish that dis that that the genealogies or trace that dislocation. So in Brazil, someone who makes a promise to a saint or has a relationship to a Orisha um, ties those ribbons in in their wrists, right, to make a promise, right, to a promise or to make a wish. And then once that that um, breaks, then the the wish that you that you have would would come to fruition or or something that that you have hope right would be uh, uh, realized. Um, they have different colors, and the colors have to do also with different forms of orishas, energies, and elements. So the color red, for instance, related to Shango, it is also related to a fiery energy or the energy of justice. So um, when I see this, I keep thinking then, what does it mean? to think of this process of dislocation of meaning and sign and what does it have to do with the, with what we are understanding as movements as transformation justice led by black people by, by trans people um, leading to justice and one of the, the the connections that i have established is that this practice is, is still very evident especially today right when we have movements and rebellions for example of the black lives matter movement um, and you have a practice of use of the sign but totally dislocated from the political dimension of that sign which informs a genealogy and an engagement with um, with movements that are anti-racist, uh, right? So what we create in this process is a, is a colonial, again, um, process of using force and a dislocation of the sign and very, you know, um, uh, emptied of this fundamental dimension, which is the, the, the political dimension of the sign, right? And so, and we have performances such as, for example, politicians going and, and painting on the, on the streets, Black Lives Matter, when the production of that sign, if you take that as a colonial understanding, which is just a performance and the imposition of a sign without that, that political dimension, then you take that as 
as, as a sign that matters, right? But if we understand that for Black trans people, the production of signs of images have to do with an action that moves energy, that produces movement, and that produces forms of justice that have been dislocated and have been erased by processes of colonialism. So those are very two different engagements with the science and productions of science. And that I want to, to bring today and to argue that for Black trans women to make sense of the representation of Black trans women of signs of freedom, you have to essentially recognize that political dimension of those signs as well. Otherwise, it's just a use that is a colonial use disconnected from those, those movements and also exploited without a commitment to the to the political aspects that those signs index as actually. Um, so, so that's where I want to start. So it's starting then with fire. Mm -hmm. Here, okay. So um, I want to start then talking about uh, fire and the concept of burning archives. Um, so burning archives, time, okay. So burning archives in Brazil in, is translated as queima de arquivo, right? And queima de arquivo is an expression that relates to, and I'm just gonna go through um, some things here, um, that relates to an expression when uh, a witness, a key witness to something is killed. Right, so if there is a witness to a certain case and they come to trial and suddenly this, this witness uh, uh, is murdered, then people use the expression queima de arquivo. They say there was a burning of archives. So for the connection that I'm establishing between what are burning archives is really to think about the different meanings of what burning is and what burning archives is. It can be an archive that is being you know, burned or an archive that carries fire, right, within itself. So um, in this sense, I think, what does it mean to think about Black trans women in relationship to this understanding of burning archives? And what I think is that the, the murders of Black trans women is one of these examples of burning archives of getting right, rid of witnesses, right, or creating impossibilities for witnessing. And what, what kind of threat of witnessing are we talking about here? We're talking about the possibilities of having witnesses to what it means to be alive as a Black trans woman in the world, right? Or we're also getting rid of the, the possibilities of Black trans women ourselves being those witnesses of what it is to experience those intersecting relationships of power being embodied in that experience as well. So I, I think of that as then as this as this form of of pyro necropolitics, right? That you have the the set of a set of strategies that literally burn or let people just just be murdered or 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 just being consumed by fire um, in that sense, right? Or literally by firing at those people, right? Or uh, literally by just let archives being consumed within fire. And and what I think about that is also understanding that murders are letting someone die or letting archives or different forms of archives and here so I'm talking about the body as an archive as well in the case of, of the black trans women but also different forms of archives that are just not well that they're just not being taken care of right so um and this relates to other forms of archives as well in Brazil the museum the national museum uh in the country was also uh, burned like like a lot of archives that were actually produced about different things of the country was also um, not well kept and they were not um, necessarily 
intentionally for what I know, you know, burned, but at the same time, they were in such conditions that I can just that they were let these archives burn, right? And so thinking about that, what does it mean to have also the state letting certain archives die, right? And and the relationship to fire. And what would incur into those witnesses or what are we not witnessing or what are these archives constituting forms of witnessing that is being killed uh, and then let that uh, die for the, the state. But what does it mean to think about this other form of archive uh, or other meaning of burning fire, of burning archives, sorry, of bur as the archive that carries within itself uh, flame, right? Um, and this is the one form of archive that I want to convey in this picture. So, uh, so this picture is a picture of uh, Kayla Simpson, which is the president of uh, the National Association for uh, Travis Cheese and, uh, and uh, Trans Women and Transsexuals in, in Brazil. And this is Meg Hayata, a professor, an academic, one of the, um, the few um, PhDs, uh, Black trans women that we have and in Brazil. And they are burning a document, which is a diagnosis, psycho you know, psychological diagnosis of uh, dysphoria. And they posted that on Facebook. So I want to give some time to read real quick uh, something that I've structured about that scene um, to you. So on March 1st, 2018, I receive a message from Leonardo, a black trans man, an activist, dear friend of mine, telling me that the Supreme Court in Brazil had approved the trans movement's demand of requesting name change without the need of psychologists and social workers diagnosis and surgery. His message ends with an emoji with tears and by him saying he's touched, emotional, emocionado, muita luta. O choro hoje é de emoção e alegria. He says, I'm emotional. A great deal of fight of tears today are of the tears today are feeling emotional and joyful. I call my mother for our usual check-in, and she says she saw on TV the trans women, mulheres trans, could have their name changed without prejudice. There won't be no more prejudice. People can just live their lives, my mom says. As I catch up on my friend's celebration on Facebook, I see Kayla Simpson's post, who is a travesti negra, one of the historical leading voices in this fight uh, in the country, along with other two black trans women. But here I'm focusing on um, Kayla, who is on the left, and with Maggie Hayata, who is on, on the right. This is from a video they posted. So the video is captioned by Kayla um, as, you who got used uh, to sell gender dysphoria diagnosis or dictate how travestis and transsex transsexuals should behave to obtain one of those, one of these, and she shows the diagnosis. That's over. Um, here's a video in homemade to y'all. Quema de arquivo in this scene is reassembled and it acquires the meaning of a ritual with a sense of fugitive justice using Hartman and Bass word, words. It is one of the, the instances of a pragmatic win, but with an, uh, an awareness of a history of failure and that much work is still needed. It produces the meaning of a sense of hope surrounding with a fire that fuels movements for justice, a kind of Shango fire. Kayla unpacks the history of pathologization um, of trans people and the power exercised through the technology of the diagnosis as conditioned to access a document that reflects our names. The ritual makes us remember a history of the requirement of the plausible, his uh, the plausible story, a medicalized narrative of the true transsexual, right, according to the book, the books, Benjamin's book, Living Pose, make a reference um, it's analysis that, that is made that has been talked about by Sandy Stone in the post, post transsexual manifesto. The plausible story of I have always been, the plausible story, which is usually, oh, I have always been a woman since I can remember as a child, 
and I, and I did or I want surgery, for example. Well, despite this is true for many of us, our stories are so much more complex and nuanced than this compulsory trans story. In the case of this gender dysphoria diagnosis in Brazil, the plausible story does not necessarily ask us to create a story of a past of cisness and a race transitioning, as, as the Benjamin's book would advise. The plausible story is one, it is one only kind of narrative of transness that is somewhat intelligible to the state that forces trans people to behave by erasing the narrative's nuances and dissidents. I shared that video on my page and caption it by paraphrasing Kayla's word in the video. Kayla, Kayla Simpson says in the video, let it burn. This trans body does not belong to you anymore, diagnosis, <laughs> she says. And in the video, in the video, as they burn the diagnosis, the document, they, they state with laughter, leave this body that doesn't belong to you anymore. So she says, the joke merges the refusal of the control over the trans body, both by the medical field, but also the, the control, the production of the controller images, demonizing trans people by evangelical church and their political parties who produce rituals and images of exercising trans and black bodies on online videos by stating, leave this body that doesn't belong to you anymore, demon. Both of these fields, the medical and evangelical uh, churches, have profited out of the creation of these images of pathology, demon, and fear of trans and black bodies. The acknowledgement of these histories foregrounded when Kayla starts the video by saying, the aquazinho uh, que você ganha dando, dando laudo, she says that money that you used to make with diagnosis, you can't do that anymore. Aqua is a Yoruba word transed or incorporated into travestis vocabulary in Brazil, and that means money. So she also adds, you, radical psychologists who say you help people without actually helping us, a decision by the Supreme Court, there is no more diagnosis. So I, I want to then think of uh, burning archives and the relationship to the sign of fires and as a way to think of how firing, as, as a way of producing images that fire back, right? Instead of being fired at um, by the state and, and how the understanding of freedom is not this very clear cut uh, understanding that we have um, in terms of complete freedom, but under a very liminal space that which is with pragmatic wins, but at the same time, histories of failures. And that by reproducing those images and reassembling the, this, this, this uses of these archives, Black trans women are leading and in producing those images that talk about this political history of leading and pressure for, um, for a living, for conditions of living as well. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about also the reassembling um, the space of knowledge within um, Brazil Academia. And I want to focus on Meg Hayata in this picture. Yeah. So Meg Hayata is uh, one uh, black uh, trans feminist and who recently um, uh, published this book called not, not, not on the, Neither on the Margin and Nor in the Center as well. And this is the, the cover of, of, of her book and has a Marsha P. Johnson on the book. So she talks about the experiences of Black trans women in Brazil. And this is also an intertext with the, the work of, of uh, um, Bell Hooks too. And so this tells us of how this diasporic connection is also traveling through texts that are images, story, histories of movements and theory as well, um, and being rearranged, but also um, used by Black trans women in Brazil, right? And this also reflects how uh, Black trans women are becoming 
in pushing to be also associated with the sign of writers, right? With the understandings and icons, icons of, of, of writers that have been um, revealing a rearrangement of the editorial um, landscape in Brazil. So um, Black women, Black cis women and Black trans women are pushing and producing so much movement that we can be ignored at this point. So Dejamila Ribeiro, for instance, who is a Black cis woman, have been one of the, the, the best, had one of the best sellers um, in, in Brazil, which is a little manual for uh, uh, talking about how to be uh, an anti, uh, how to do the work of anti-racism. And, and that book has been translated in many different languages. Um, recently, I was in a conference of site Black Women in Texas, and uh, Sueli Carneiro, who is one of our very prominent Black feminists in Brazil, was talking about how this book and the popularity, but also how this book by this Black a cis woman has achieved such a um, huge audience that has forced the editorial market in Brazil to rethink or to pay attention to the demand of the, that production. So the case of Maggie Hayata is part also of this pressure of this movement and also of a new generation of readers who are really also uh, hungered to, to have and to read uh, and also pressuring and also getting together and creating different forms of, of, of press initiatives to publish those texts as well. Um, I want to talk about both uh, the symbol then of Meg Hayata in, 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 in combination with the, the text by Marsh B. Johnson is to think about what does it mean to have those Black trans women in different contexts transnationally, not only from Brazil in being in conversation with Marsha, but also uh, for my work being some uh, Black trans women within the US, right? In conversation uh, with, uh, with the work by Marsha and Silver Rivera as well. And I want us to think also how we think of those signs and the use of, Mar especially Marsha, and totally dislocated and creating again the colonial production of signs which use Marsha's signs but totally dissociates the political line and the political dimension of that sign as well right so Meg Hayata within the pandemic for instance has been um, not only talking about her work but also articulating um, fundraising and other forms of, of support for women who are, for trans women who are, for example, losing their shelter within the pandemic as well, right? So the use of Marsha is not only about informing a history of movements, but also it is, it is producing that action of that movement and engaging with movements in Brazil to honor that dimensional, the political dimension of that sign that Mar the Marsha indexes with her flowers, for instance. Nobody asks, for instance, where does, uh, where do these flowers come from, right? If you watch some of Marsha's um, videos and some of her testimonies or people who talk about it, they say that some of these flowers are from some of the people who would sell flowers under the tables where she used to sleep here in New York. Right? So there is a situation of homelessness um, that indexes those flowers and the history of those flowers that have not really been brought to the forefront when we think, for example, of discourses around canceling rent nowadays, right? Like what does it mean to, to index a Black trans woman and Marsha and her flowers to inform the discussions that we have about sheltering, about a pandemic, about a crisis under this context, right? Uh, what does it mean also for us to use those symbols and to think about what does it mean to think about freedom and whether we are putting us in the frame or not, right? And how strategic is that or how strategic it is to use that, those signs and dislocate or erase the, the political dimension of that sign um, as well. I apologize for interrupting, Dara. I think you have about five minutes left and then we're going to move to the Q&A. Okay. 
Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, I just want, uh, so, uh, hmm. okay, so this is Kayla Simpson and Giovanna Cardozo, who are the creators of, of the, the movements in um, trans movement in, in Brazil, and Giovanna is currently the, the Black Trans um, Association a Forum, a National Forum in Brazil as well. And I'm losing because, again, in the background, you have uh, Marcia and also Silvia Rivera in this conversation of these two founders also of the movements in Brazil. So the creation of that um, dialogue within this image of these two movements. And I had, and I'm going to leave this a little bit for later, this image um, here, which is basically what, what also has inspired my, my, my framework for this discussion, which is a work by, um, uh, by these two artists, Andrea Bowers and, and Ada Tinnell, and that was made in 2016, and they had this exhibit uh, the, about feminism, the threads of feminism, and they have these three pieces um, that really called my attention, which was one called Goddess, the Power of the Common Public, a roundtable discussion, and I'm articulating this with those ribbons that I, that I talked in the beginning of this presentation, and the work of this artist uh, does this amazing um, connections between the, the understanding of faith, right, of, of understandings of what hope is, the carrying the energies of that in relationship to how the understandings of freedom is represented by wings, right? Um, so in some of the these these threads, you have some of this um, these aspects that we have faith in, which is like in the some of the feminist um, sayings like the, the personal, political, and other feminisms of threads. So this panel in this in, in this panel that you have Susan McDonald's and um Jen said uh Gutierrez uh is framed by those 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 threads of feminism right but also by those energies and also tied in this panel of 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 ribbons that have to do with this genealogies of faith of ritual but also of, of afro um uh, cosmologies and Afro religions as well. So I think my work, I'm always interested in how to do that. They, they are represented visually. How do, can we read the Black trans experiences um, through the Black trans women conversations in conversations also with um, uh, Latinx women who are not uh, Black, but that forge a sense of solidarity and also collaboration that understands our different positionalities in this world transnationally as well, and how that can also really make us think of this dimension of this sign that is political. Why does this make sense here? It only makes sense because we understand that there is a genealogy of movements for freedom, in you know, when kids of CC, that there is movements for freedom for uh, against uh, deportation and the brutality of ISIS in case of Genesis Gutierrez, and also that these women are are pushing for a space of freedom, and also speaking out of turn, is speaking when people don't want to hear, right? And the case of Genesis on the right is the how her work has that is a work that did not start with her interrupting, not interrupting with her speaking. Uh, in an Obama's um, um, discourse in the White House, but people now know Janice is the woman who interrupted President Obama, right, when she was uh, speaking about against ICE uh, and against the deportations. So that's what I'm saying. If you only see that without the trace of the di in the political dimension of the sign, um, it's a colonial way of understanding and engaging with sign production, right? But uh, the form of decolonizing and also producing and, and, and also understanding the value of Black trans women as the signs of freedom and representation is to really take seriously that dimension, which is the dimension that's for, for, for fights and producing movements for freedom. Uh, I think, I, I hopefully I did in time, I here and there. Thank you, Dora. I think you give us a lot to think about 
about the ways in which framing shape how we assemble and disassemble concepts on the semiotics that undergird um, colonial erasure. And of course, the sort of archival, the disruptions that we're, that we're doing to um, archives that might not necessarily be uh, counterproductive. And here I'm also thinking about the sort of the connections between your own work and the work of our own faculty, Marcus' work on anarchisms otherwise, Jaina's work on fugitivity, Cisco's work on cultural production, and Wendy's work on archive um, and, you know, filming archive as a documentarian and so on. And so thank you for that. I really appreciate it. And I think now we're actually going to um, open uh, for a discussion and we have like about 30 minutes or so. And then we're going to close it and have a, a, um, an intimate discussion with our students. So if you have any questions, you could raise your hand using the chat function, or you could type your questions, um, or you could signal in some way that um, you have a question, and um, we'll proceed from there. Thank you. Should I stop sharing that later? Um, so I can see if you want to have yeah, if if yeah, maybe that's it. Okay. Do we have questions or comments? Um I I'm trying to see if I can see. Sad, I'll jump in because I don't think you can see me. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's Maka. Yeah. Um, and I think May said she has a question after me. So um, thank you so much, Dora. That was such a beautiful talk. And I learned so much from listening to the way in which you were positioning Black trans diasporic rituals and um, cultural production and aesthetics. And I think, especially thinking from an art and design school, I just really appreciated how you were connecting kind of the dimensions of um, Black trans embodiment to these genealogies of, of religion. And I had a question about that. Um, I, I, you know, I really liked how you were talking about this kind of evangelist movement, right, that we know that has produced a kind of discourse of, um, of abjection around Black trans bodies in the ways you were discussing and, and all of those kind of um, taking in some ways and um, perversion in a negative sense of uh, diasporic Yoruba based religions. And then on the other hand, you have this beautiful rearrangement and engagement. How does one read into such an overdetermined political space? I mean, you are walking us through and I think we do it because you are such a careful thinking, thinker and able to walk us through the space. But I, I find sometimes when I'm following the political scene in Brazil um, or any other overdetermined space of kind of religious right wing engagement and attack and hate speech, that sometimes is very difficult to, um, to understand, you know, those, those uh, different deployments and, and their political ends. So, I don't know, it's just a kind of question of maybe a methodology or to ask you to elaborate a little bit more. Um, but thank you so much. I really enjoyed listening to you and seeing those images. Um, thank you for, for that question. So um, the, my, my concern in, in my discussion was how uh, evangelical uh, churches have been really gained political power by uh, using churches as a space of supporting and advertising really right-wing um, candidates and even electing them. So the current president, for example, Bolsonaro gained a lot of visibility and also uh, vote voters through um, the advertisement by these churches, right? That there was the one from God and you know the, 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 all these things. Um, so uh, trans women um, have been engaging also with that by engaging with what these churches understand as a sign of justice, right? And that is Jesus, right? For some of these churches. So there was um, a protest by a black trans woman, by, by a trans woman, I think she was black, a, trans, a Brazilian trans woman in which she was in a cross 
as Jesus, right? And uh, I, I, I didn't bring that image, but, and um, and she performed, she did the performance and she, you know, painted her with blood and everything. And she was like on the cross as Jesus. And there was, of course, infuri people were infuriated by, by that saying like how, but at the same time, other people said, yes, that makes a lot of sense. We are the crucified people in this country, the like people who are really killing us, that that's what we have. But at the same time, it was an engagement with this idea of Christianity by saying, we acknowledge that what you see and the signs that you use to think about faith and to think about compassion and to think about justice, why can't you see us through that, right, um, as well? So I'm, and why can't you also think through that in relationship to everything that we are pushing to be seen through within education, within uh, health, within other, and also politically speaking, right? So I think that there is not a total negation in relationship to that. There is an engagement, I think, for example, with that. So I don't want to say that the response to the demonization is total negation or a confrontation in, in, in that sense. It is also an engagement with, with uh, Christianity, right? So the, the, my article that I talked uh, recently, Mais Viva, about selling, um, the story, I think her sister is from one of those evangelical Christian uh, you know, churches, and that's her, her support, right, um, but in her life. So I want really to talk, as I say, about like the nuances of how I am bringing the very growing use of, of, of churches as this machine for the, through the right wing, but at the same time, that there are other internal strategies that can also be, uh, uh, you know, used to engage and to to, to think about uh, the black trans women's experience in the country as well. I don't know if I'm if I answered your question. Okay. I think we have a question from Professor Me Joseph. Do you want to read it out, Me? Sure. Hi. Um... Uh, Dora, that was uh, just a really compelling talk and uh, really very powerful. Um, and I was uh, very, uh, sort of, I'm still trying to understand your opening image of the mangaka figure and then Kisi about, and you were sort of comparing yourself to it. And I didn't quite see, I didn't understand that fully, if you could elaborate it a little bit. And, um, and then maybe uh, if you could make that connection because the figure is so interesting because the idea of the figures, you put poisonous nails into the figure to, yeah. Yeah, to, put, to take the poison out of you, but it's a colonial, you were talking about it's colonial history and how the burning of the documents, you know, brings this whole performative, performative Congo, Congo um, Afro-Brazilian connection into a new anthropophagic connection. Mm -hmm. uh, so please, if you could talk a little bit more about your opening comment, I, I didn't fully understand, it's just really great. Yeah. So the way I have developed my work around that image and engagement with that ritual is more on the not aspect of it, right? And the possibility of understanding um, the, the different meanings and and not as 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 a way to think of how we hold things and how we hold energy in the nodding right process in their body, so I I think that my verbal my body language like doing about inserting in my own body made that connection of the body and my body, but I'm not uh, saying that I am thinking about Black trans women and body in relationship to the body of the Nkisi, right? I'm thinking of how the process of creation of the Nkisi as this, this process of, n of not working and establishing connections can be a way of understanding the, the ways that we can think of not working and thinking about networks Afro diasporically, right? And how certain dimensions of that image have been reproduced in some forms of, of thinking of how, um, of how the knot is still holds energy somehow through the, the, these practices in Brazilian Afrocosmologies as well. So I think that's what I am, I am, I'm going, I'm going for 
less than the the environment in relationship to what is filled and the poisonous it's in the body itself but as 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 a framework to think of how we think understandings of network of of, of uh, the virtuality of uh, of uh, agreements in collective formation of a body of work right um for shifting in energies in a, in, a, in a different in a certain way does that make does that thank you yeah it's beautiful okay do we have other questions um you can also write your question in the chat or message me if you have a question jana hi thank you dora that was just so beautiful and the images that you brought you know just stunning and um uh, can uh, i really uh, respond re, uh, had a response to the the burning of the archive and um wonder if you could say just some more about the body as archive just an opening for you to say some more about that mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um so i i i'd say in my work that uh the stories or the kind of language that 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 we have that is linear that is oral it's a very precarious way of disembody this this embodied knowledge of right that that we carry so um that's why i keep trying to create other forms of language into disembodied or combining my body into that so that's why i had performance that's why i had the painting that's why i, I write i have i have a a, a, a talk as a way of, of structuring or, or creating different languages around things that we carry with us, right? And things that we know that we know, but um, that just saying, I know, it's sometimes refused or not intelligible to create conditions for our livability, right? Um, so I think a lot about uh, the body as an archive, but also in the sense of also as, as, as a way to think about technology. So I am really thinking also that the understandings that we have today of network, of virtuality, of technology is really informed already by Afro-cosmological, Afro-experiences, and that really the body informs us to think about the way that we want to think about information, archive, and knowledge, right? So I'm currently writing about uh, timing and temporality and relationship to, to, to embodiment because during this time, and Ms. Major in that book, Trap Door, talks a lot about how uh, Black trans women have always, are always ready uh, in a crisis, right? So in the, and the black trans woman to have herself, for example, to have a job during the um, AIDS pandemic, right? Or, and um, in the crisis, she said that that's when black trans women have jobs because she, she, they were able to care for people that people didn't want to care for, right? And so this, this knowledge about what does it mean to live in a crisis? What does it mean to live in a pandemic? already have been informed by this, this genealogies of movements that led by Black trans women of what it means to be in a crisis. So the body has that knowledge of what it is to me to, to be in a crisis. So then when the government was in crisis, other people didn't know what to do. Uh, a lot of organizations that were led by Black trans women here in New York and different parts of the world were using the strategy to organize, right? Like we're like we know how this feels, right? We have we carry this within our bodies. Like we have this archive, and also people who are trained in that uh, kind of uh, of knowledge. So we're gonna act, you know, on on on, on in ways that are not um, the being addressed by these structures that forget, but also um, intentionally erase the ways that we have been using to form agreement, uh, to form networks of support, or even understandings of, prom of promoting justice, right? Different forms of justice as well. Another thing about the archive is like, what is the timing of an archive? And we're thinking of the archive as something digital nowadays, like so much like the digital, and we're rethinking about temporality so much 
being formed as a technological that is outside of our bodies, that we are imposing on our own bodies the timing of these outside technologies, right? Like we were in the moment of talking about um, movements that address in, in, against anti-blackness, anti against transphobia, against those things. And people are asking us to process like a computer. They like get over it, like process it like the, the next core, you know, like chip or something. And it creates, if we understand our biases and archives and the ways that we archive things, but we also process things, we understand that it takes a long time to process very complex and traumatic things. So um, we're not getting over like now because the understanding of technology now is processing in two seconds, right? We are understanding and we are archiving our time and temporality in different ways so that this thing can work. Like so that we think of transformative justice in the timing that our body reminds us of going through it, right? Because of the wise people don't think in terms of the generations that we need to, to have this whole new world that we are forming. Yeah, and it also makes me think about what it means to archive, especially when information is being produced instantaneously all the time via social media and it's also being circulated all the time. So what does it mean to both intervene, but to also maintain an archive? Um, do we have, oh, Jack, you have a question? Yeah, but I didn't want to interrupt you, Zach. I, I'd love to hear what you were saying. Oh no, I don't have any profound thoughts about that. We just think about it a lot, especially in the social media lab, because for example, how do you propose a methodology for studying social media archives? What should be included in the archive? What is the methodology for tracing knowledge production online, especially when that knowledge changes all the time? And, but then I think it is important to archive that because a lot of that knowledge is also being produced by minoritized subjects. And we want to sort of acknowledge that and, and think about how it's making us rethink the ways in which we move around space, either in everyday life or online, but it's something that I think about a lot. Um, so, yeah. Well, my, my point is quite connected to that, Zat, in the sense that, the, I mean, obviously I think um, everyone is really thinking, Dora, with you about the question of the archive, which has been such a tricky question for trans studies, as you said, in relationship to Sandy Stone's essay. Um, and so pointing to these other traditions of archive making just seems so generative to me. And, um, you know, I'm, I, I'm super interested in the knot, as you say. Um, it comes up in Jeannie Vaccaro's, uh, one of her essays on trans craft, and she talks about crocheting, right? Uh, and an artist who makes these whole coral reefs out of uh, crocheting um, in order to point to a non-medical model of self-making, um, this notion of crafting becomes very, very resonant, I think. And so it was really beautiful to hear about the ribbons and the history of these ribbons that, you know, carry certain kinds of aspirations within them, but are also aesthetic objects of their own. And then I was also thinking about um, uh, the Andean form, uh, Marco knows more about this, the kipu, right? The, the strings and knotting. And I was wondering whether there was a connection that you could make to that tradition of creating a whole alphabet out of knots that then also is outside of this colonial notion of an archive made up as Maria Elena Martinez's work shows of these medical records that become singular, uh, diagnostic, pathologizing, and so on. So I'm super interested in the archive, but for that reason, and I don't mean this as a critique, I just have an honest curiosity as to how we then move to Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera, because not that they are parts of a colonial archive, but they are well-known figures at this point within yes, an Afro-diasporic context, but very much out of the global north and figures who have been sort of resurrected within the global north, belatedly, in fact, um, not at all in their own time. And I wonder whether um, 
one would trace the archive that you're interested in differently if you were working with a, a, a Brazilian archive of black women as opposed to making the move to Marsha P. Johnson? It's just a question, like, wouldn't we have then moved to Latin America or somewhere else in the global south rather than there? Um, so the conversation around, uh, I think I'm going to start from the last part of your questions, and, and I think there have uh, different questions about syncretism here, and and that I think you're saying something before, Jack. Um, I I missed the part. I don't know if you're here or I can just answer. What do you, what do you want me to do? <laughs> Are you asking me, Dora? Yeah, that, oh. no, that, 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 that was saying something before or? No, I was just thinking about social media and temporality and, and what does it mean to archive on social media, especially because this image is circulate. Mm -hmm. And what are we doing with that? Mm -hmm. And then going back to, of course, Jack's question about the iconography and, and using images and icons that, that um, travel ac across borders and like the specific decision to feature Marsha, Marsha P. Johnson, for example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's very different from a black trans woman to feature Marsha P. Johnson in her cover than a wealthy NGO in, with white directors boards in the US feature Marsha P. Johnson in their materials. I think those are very different things. And I think I, I, the, so then I think that the colonial use of Marcia Regis in, in Silver Rivera is in, in, in the letter, right? In which you're like, we have this, you know, which is a, what um, a Riley in, in, um, and uh, Heritor and talk in the trans politics, the use of black trans women for profit in af of the afterlife in relationship to, to so that is a use. Um, and I was very careful to frame these, the Marcia Regis within uh, the work of, a, of another Black trans woman, because I, I face that as a transnational dialogue, right? That is being done through through the South, and that is something that is already taking place, and that 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 is also revealing these critical engagements with uh, Afro diasporic, uh, not Afro diasporic, but Black production of knowledge within the U.S. Right, so. I really also want to affirm that because that's position where I am and that's position of other people who are doing the work in Brazil. And I don't wanna, I, I don't wanna, is, and I wanna be also pointed about that because whenever there is the kind of engagement, there is the, you know, famous article about Bourdieu, right? About that Brazil, black Brazilians are using race uncritically from the US and engaging with colonial, you know, kind of thinking. And I, I don't think that, I think that is a different kind of, of transition and travel of engagement um, by Black trans women in relationship to those images and those histories that is more about, we are doing this work, they're doing that, that work there as well. So I am foregrounding that in that sense, instead, of, oh, I am um, using those images to actually profit somehow from them, right? Without commitment with actually what the, the life of these women's entail, right? Um, so I, I, I want to, I think, establish that, that those use for Black trans women in that case, in, in this case that I'm talking, I don't think that is, um, it is um, a colonial in that sense. Is I discussed in my first article that I published transitionings and returnings when the ideas of routes and coming back, right, is usually this, uh, this very colonial of routes and everything. But when you think about transitioning within Black trans experiences, this recalls a very different dimension of meaning for those signs in relationship to these other uses of colonial tropes, such as, you know, the, tra the travel, the returning, and in this case, the use of Marsha P. Johnson image. Um, I think there is that aspect. The other one about the nods, uh, 
I in the mathematical aspect in the alphabet. So I'm I came I called something that called my attention and I always used the story is the story, history of Kimbanda, right? So that you're only able to think about the Kimbanda, which is this trans figure in Brazil because of the knot on her fabric, the way that she 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 wrapped her fabric and made the knot in front of her as uh, the women that also in the Congo would also use that the knot in that sense. So the knot was this point of, of encoding a very specific form of femme African-ness, right, through the knot. And even nowadays, the histories of trans kids, trans femmes as, as kids, we made of our illicit clothing out of knotting sheets in, you know, and made in that. And, and so the knot is not only uh, like ritualistic, but it is sartorial, it is aesthetic, it is mathematical, right? And it, it, is, it is virtual too, right? When you think about these knots represented in, in that work analysis as well. So um, I think that's where I'm framing um, my, my discussion and, and the connections to that. Uh, to the, the the potential of of, of not as this this um, framework to 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 explain how the the indexation of gender and race in those histories of the colonial and the colonial can um, be um, associated with that. Uh, I have a question by uh, Sar Sa Sara. Sara Nicholas, do you, do, uh -huh. do you want me to read the question, or would you rather read it? Um, so I think I can, I can, do you want to read it? Should I, what is yeah. the protocol? <laughs> Sarah, would you like me to read your question or would you like to read it? I can read it. I just wanted to get it out there before I forgot. Um, yeah, thank you, Dora. It was a really wonderful presentation. And I was just wondering if you could come, I think it kind of connects really well um, with Jack's question, but if you can comment on like Brazilian cultural syncretism and, you know, anthropophagy as like part of Brazilian cultural theory um, to like this rearranging of symbols, right? So the first thing that kind of came to mind was sort of the throwing away of like copyright, you know, in, in Brazil in general, but I, I was thinking of Gabi Amarantus's um, Shirley music video and song where um, she's just kind of unabashedly like saying, I'm gonna copy you, I'm gonna take what's external, right? And I think that's more of like a position in relation to the colonial, right? Um, in relation to like European influences, et cetera. But um, I'm wondering your thoughts sort of like on that embedded in um, Brazilian culture in this context of like, absolutely like the, the Marsha P. Johnson, Sylvia Rivera being used in this way is speaking to a different, um, another way to think about these, the, these connections, right? These use of different symbols um, and rituals and their political dimensions. So it's really just, you know, any further comments on like this, this sort of cultural um, theory or cultural concept of um, copying or devouring or, or taking in something and making it your own, you know, which, you know, I think we can think about in terms of gender and sexuality as well. Um, so I think the first thing it calls, thank you, Sara, obrigada for coming. Um, it, on your question that for me I would re, be concerned is about the concept of copying, right? And especially talking about Black trans women experience it. And for me, the thing about copying like, <laughs> and copyrights, it's because I think my, that syncretism, when you think of syncretism, is like copying something in relationship to copy, to copyright. I think I'm more interested in understanding that the productions of, of those times in this, in this, that has a very uh, hierarchical power relation, right? Like it is not like the encounter and then you exchange, right? Like it is, you can't have these signs, these anything, these religions, none, none of these things, you, these all is, are demonized and people just trying to, to hold to their faith, to their ways of healing, to the, you know, to ways of creating community, rearrange those things in ways that, that assure somehow their, there's vitality, right? And I think of vitality as these strategies to what allows you to be alive and also to, 
to have a connection with what you value. And so the thing about, so I don't know if it's more about copy, like in, in, in copyright, because it has to do with, I will do that because I see uh, something that I'm interested in, right? It is, there, there's not that willingness in the process of colonialism. It's hardly a willingness, right? It is, it is, it's a total uh, imposition and I'm not erasing also the willingness of people who are in situations of colonization to also be interested and say, well, let's see what this is. But the major context is a very imbalanced position. So the th understanding that we will, we will copy because I want to instead of of because I have these conditions of power, um, I think are, are, are different uh, things here. I am, what I'm more interested in saying is that under this very imbalanced conditions of power and exercising people are forced to have displacements of meanings. How, how is that um, within this current context and how can we really think about that when we're thinking in terms of the conditions for people to produce knowledge and to produce science, right? Uh, and to interpret and, and to uh, interpret science, like to be code interpreters, right? I consider trans women, black trans women, other people who are in situations uh, being in different areas, it's a very strategic network to become interpreters of different codes, right? Um, so we had a, recently a, a, a black trans woman in Brazil, 22 years, Jessica, I think her name, um, that, that was like not a lot of, because she was not, she she passed of some heart attack. It was not like a, a murder, something. But what she talked about is that she became a lawyer because she wanted to interpret the, that code that nobody explained to her. So being in different areas is having this tool to be interpreters of codes right, that have been used and weaponized against us, right, and less, less the copy of rights, I, I, I think. Does that make sense? I don't know, am I answering, what, am I engaging what George is saying? Yeah, sure, I mean, I think in terms of, um, I, I was thinking, like, of course, not in the sense of copying, but in the sense of, like, copying doesn't even come into the conversation because it doesn't matter. So I like how you're positioning it as a rearrangement of symbols and like you, it, ha it takes on a different a meaning, you know, in, in the context of your talk and also like the context, the, you know, images that, that you were showing us. So thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I think one of our students, Creative Students, Beatty, has a question, um, but we're about to close the general uh, public uh, discussion so that we can actually have a discussion with our students and faculty. So before I read Beatty's brilliant question, I just wanted to ask if there's anyone else who wanted to ask a question. Okay. I just want to acknowledge my friend Eva. Thank you, Eva, for coming. <laughs> so if there are no questions, Malka, um, would you like to make some closing statements? Sure. I just want to thank you again, Dora, for being here and for presenting such original and powerful work, um, as May said, and for engaging the Pratt community on these issues. And I think you really enliven for us what it means to think about um, a Black trans episteme or ontology or really think about these decolonizing forms of methodologies and that really break down the kind of old ways of thinking about inside outside you know work or ethnography you're really doing something much more complex and and moving between theories so thank you thank you for joining us we learned a lot i learned a lot and i know the students from even private um chat messages have gotten so much out of uh, your talk today. So we'll continue with the students and I just wanted to um, say thank you to everyone for joining us and if you're interested in further programming you can um, send an email to Cisco Bradley who will put um, their uh, um, his uh, email in the chat box and just send a quick message to him and you can uh, sign up with us. So thank you to the general public for joining us. Thank you, Zat, for a wonderful moderation. And we'll move now to um, a closed session with Pratt students, other students, and Pratt faculty. Thank you again, Dora. Thank you for a beautiful presentation. Thank you. Okay, hang on, Dora. Okay, good. <laughs> Bye everyone else. Thank you again.
Maybe we'll we'll just hold for a second as we transition. Go ahead. I'll hand it back to you, Zach. Okay. So, okay, I think it's just our students now. So we have previous faculty and students and a question from Betty, um, who has asked me to read it. So Betty says, thank you for the talk. Um, names hold a lot of power and symbols. We have used names in history to belittle others in today's time as a way of uh, empowerment. We have reclaimed and re-identified re-identified ourselves through new names. Do you find the art of language and renaming to be a form of decolonization and liberating identity or restricting and creating a false sense of freedom uh, through naming? Um, from decolonizing, liberating identity or restricting, creating a false sense of freedom in naming? Well, I think it can be both, can be both, right? Um, um, so when, especially we, we uh, the, the conversation that I'm, I'm interested in terms of naming, when, um, we name ourselves, right? When we name, um, ourselves as black trans women, as trans people, and the condition, the conditions that we need to, to achieve in order to have that recognized for, for different reasons, uh, it is a form of, of a sense of, it gives an aspect of sense of freedom, right? And when we rename uh, things in ways that you affirm a certain genealogy, a certain association with the kind of coding of, of the history that you want to do through that name, right? And here I'm using Ruha Benjamin when she talks about uh, naming as a form of coding and the importance of name bringing certain aspects such as race, such as uh, um, ethnicity through naming, right? Uh, or unmarkedness, unmarkedness in case of names that are really associated with whiteness. And uh, so there can be that is, so that is this aspect of free. And, but it's one aspect in relationship to a set of other uh, aspects of one's life that guarantees livability. Just saying that you're gonna name and you're gonna, for, for example, a law that does prevent uh, uh, trans women for, for have been asked over and over for a name that is, was assigned to them is solving their problems about transphobia? No, right? But also diminishing that does uh, the, the, the work of preventing certain things that would be freeing for us. So currently in the pandemic, I was having a conversation with another professor, a, a black trans woman who is another PhD professor in Brazil, Jacqueline de Jesus Gomes, in her book, she has Transfeminismo. And Jacqueline was telling me how trans women were resisting going to get, for example, the, the relief fund that was uh, pressure, that the people pressured the government to, to, to produce. And because of this documentation issue, of course, because of other forms of transphobia and access, but the name and the document was such a, a source of also of anxiety um, that, that, that became our conversation. But the conversation was really why these women were in situations of precarity that, that let them, that, that produced the, con the conditions for her have to go to get this relief fund, right? That's actually what this process of the naming and, and the anxiety about not getting the fund because of the naming is also attaching these other dimensions of, of what it means free free to, to have your name in this document in context of a situation of precar you know, precarious conditions right and the political um disorganization and and hate towards poor people in the in the current government in in, in brazil and in here too right so i think that's uh what uh, the, the, this, the, the different layers of the discussion about naming we can have so that we don't think it's either this or that, right? But, the, but what that can impact as other things for us as well. Thank you. Do we have other questions from uh, CritVis faculty and students? Uh, our students have actually read your work. So we would really love to hear from you. You could either type your question in the chat or message me or speak with Dora. Wendy? I'm going to jump in. Yes. <laughs> Donna, really, thank you so much for coming. Um, 
the talk was fantastic. Your work has inspired our students so much. Um, we have many thesis students who are working with iconicity, with uh, black trans feminisms, with um, archival violence, decolonial geographies. So I can't say for them that it, the, your work has been, you know, like a turning point uh, in their projects. Um, and one of the things that we kept thinking about while discussing your work is that, especially when you're dealing with archival violence and um, archives of violence, um, the role of uh, care and caretaking is very important. Uh, and this is something that all the students have been dealing with. How do you transform or um, recirculate these uh, archives of violence so that in a way it transmits or transforms into an archive of care? So um, I wanted to see if you could expand a little bit more on how you do that. Mm -hmm. um, so Sajia Hartman's uh, Venus Interact really helped me to do, but also her, the her recent work on um, uh, the, you know, Afrofabulation, like in, in as Tavia also refers to, uh, th th to think, to filter through these archives and when name, since we're talking about name, having even a name is a privilege, right? Like when um, we don't even have names, so that that we have to re to re tell, like in ways that at point feels um, the care through the language and through the retelling that we we process. So I filter things um, that. For example, this history of the Kimbanda, which is in a, in a, in a Inquisition's report, and they say, "Oh, we tied at this man, and they had this mushrooms or like some some hair that it was like this, and did like that." So my first, and this is for now too. My first uh, reaction is to think like, how was this person feeling at the time? Like, did their family know that they were being taken? Like, do they have community? How, this, how, did, they, how did they choose that those clothes that they were ripping apart, them apart in order to investigate their, you know, their sex? Like, very basic things that you'd ask to someone else in any situation that you would see on the streets, you know, happening if you see them as a human being, right? I think those are the, the questions that I ask for the archive and, and they elaborate on and, 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 and re, I think, tell that in ways that emphasize um, those very basic questions, right? Like, if they say that this was, people feared because there was a demon that says that she was the mother of the waters and da-da-da. I think about the con what where did this person live in which context like why so this person lived during a process of brutal uh, trauma through the water if this person was calling herself the mother of the waters and people would not brutalize her because that's what these people thought well if they don't brutalize this person probably they fear her well maybe yes but maybe it could respect her maybe she was an essential process of healing through the trauma of the water if the mother of the water we just came through the water through this trauma they knew someone important right like so, so i think about what would it be for that person to live under those conditions and to try to filter the demonizing and delegitimizing language of course with eyes from today we call their history through that but at the same time tracing what whatever i'm able to get from the presence and the existence of that person uh then thank you i think that's really beautiful it also makes me think about the archive as not something that's dead but something that's always alive that's living and moving and, and circulating um do we have other questions So I have a question actually, because I really was very fascinated with your discussion on faith and spirituality. So I study religion. And so I was just wondering, because, you know, it really made me think a lot about how we don't necessarily 
discuss faith and spirituality when we discuss um, like uh, trans bodies and so on. So how has your analysis of faith and spirituality informed your analysis of uh, the state of being trans and, and the state of always being in a fugitive state? Mm -hmm. um, uh, so the very language that we have within um, the language that Akwe, for example, right, that 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 um, um, Kayla Simpson used is a Yoruba uh, lexicon, like word that be, that now became as uh, within travesties in Brazil, a certain generation, a kind of a language of secrecy, right, that you can use those terms, but also the traces the the participation of of these women in Afro religions, right, of, of queer fans and travesties in Afro-Brazilian religions from um, the, with a Yoruba uh, origin. And so that for me is, is something that is part of the understanding of, uh, of, you know, faith and movement and building formations and communities and even language, right, in, in, the, in the Brazilian um in the Brazilian context so that is not disconnected right and whenever the same thing with with blackness right the the, the understanding of blackness within Brazilian context is also associated with afro religions as well right and the, this the process of distancing oneself and demonizing those religions is also a process of distancing the engage negating some sign of blackness as well like a distancing you one from from what it is understood as as blackness and um, there is a political movement to keep those uh, teheros or those, you know, uh, sacred Afro uh, uh, spaces um, alive because of the, the the attacks against those spaces, right? And in, in, in also um, um, what they also what they represent of course you also find a lot of cases of transphobia within you know those religious aspects but the understanding of within especially brazilian context is that that certain religions are really embedded with certain political views so afro religions are really embedded to um feminist left poor like people's movements while the very this evangelical big mega churches associated with the very right wing you know you know so uh religions um so there is has been cre created this association of religion with a political and also a racialized um and classed as you know indexation of meanings to to that as well um so yeah that's really beautiful because it really makes me think about what it means to decolonize religious studies that's so focused on abrahamic faith and not this syncretism that undergirds like african religions and ways of being and, and so on so thank you um do we have other questions from could be students and faculty You know, Cisco is teaching the symposium, and Jifka and Sandra is. I wonder if any of you want to jump in before we've been working so hard here with Adora. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Dora, are translations of your work um, in the process into Spanish? Because I was I kept thinking about. Afro Latinx and Latinx solidarities and ways to achieve that. Um, so I don't know. Do you have any ideas on, of, of possible inroads? The, the last uh, article on uh, Trans Las Americas is just being translated. The one Mas Viva, it has just uh, been um, translated, and I think they have they're launching a bilingual, I think, on um, virtual online uh, issue of that of that the number. Yeah, super. Other questions or comments? Well, if there are no questions or comments, um, I think thank you, Dora, for being part of the discussion. And Martha, would you like to close the session? Yeah, just to say again, Dora, thank you so much. And we try to do have this um, 
kind of more intimate space with students and faculty. Sometimes, you know, it's hard to get students to in a broader public setting that's being recorded to feel comfortable. So that's why we do this. And I think, you know, the students have read your work and definitely engage you. So you may get an email or two later um, and <laughs> think about their questions. But thank you, everyone. Really uh, wonderful um, moderation. Thank you so much, Zat and Dora. Really an honor to have you with us tonight. Brilliant work. Thank you. We look forward to reading more. Okay. Okay. We'll follow up with anything. Thank you, everyone. Stay well. Be well. See you soon.